Okay, well, welcome everyone to the 68th meeting of New Directions in Group Theory and Triangular Categories. Today our speaker is Federico Binda from Milan, and he'll be talking to us about motivic monodromy and periodic cohomologies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to, to give a talk here. Right, so uh, this is joint work with Martin Galauer and Alberto Vizzani. Um, so let me... Right, so let me put things in context first. Okay, so um, let's say that we are interested in in studying a family of varieties, say, well, generically smooth projective uh, varieties over, say, a curve S. Okay, and uh, as it usually happens, we have a point, fixed point in in our base, say zero. And um, around that point, we can we can squeeze our family a bit, and uh, we can suppose that that point is actually the, the only singular point that we have in 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 sight. Okay, so it's a it's a classical result, but up to say a finite cover of this disk, we can actually assume that the family we are looking at is um, what is called a, a semi-stable. Well, it's something with semi-stable reduction. So it means that the special fiber. So the fiber at zero, let's say here, this f minus one of zero, appears as a strict normal crossing divisor in this uh, in this family. Okay, so associated to this kind of geometric data, we have of course the mixed touch structure on the special fiber. This is a singular variety, right? That's what we just said, and and Lean taught us how to attach to such a such an object a mixed touch structure. And their network question is, how do we relate this gadget, so the mixed touch structure on the special fiber, with, say, the cohomology of a generic element of a family? So the cohomology of xt for t, uh, an element of a disk, say t in, in delta, without zero. Right, so um, this gadget here, so of a vector space h star xt, has actually a lot of structure. So oh, there is a like work of, I mean, I, I will not try to be historically accurate in this. So I will probably forget important people in, the, in, 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 in telling you what's going on here. But I think the first person who actually wrote something about this was Simbrink, who introduced the concept of limit hodge structure. Okay, so what is the idea here? The idea is that on the vector space H star XT, so the cohomology of a generic element of our family, we can actually uh, look at the action of a certain operator, which is given by topologically by, by the fundamental group of our puncture disk. And uh, the action of this operator is nilpotent and induces a certain filtration on this, on this vector space, so the Q vector space. And you can declare this filtration to be a weight filtration. So you can actually build a mixed storage structure on the underlying vector space H star XT, where, the, where the, the weight filtration is actually produced or induced by this action of his nilpotent operator. Now, the, the result that, that somehow I promised before, so the one linking the uh, homology or the cohomology of a singular special fiber with this uh, object, which in, in a sense, is uh, carrying the information of how we uh, we got to the special fiber. So it's not ju just the X0 as a singular variety, but also remembers the fact that this X0 was in a family, okay? So this is encapsulated in the following uh, exact sequence of mixed touch structure. It's called the clemens schmidt sequence uh, by many authors. And in a nutshell, it's telling us that the fiber of a monodromy operator, so here we have, this, uh, this map N, a linking H, uh, H and lim X and H and lim X. I'm ignoring the twists for in this moment, but we'll explain them later. Now is the fiber of this operator, which again is, a, is, a, is of topological nature. So it has to do with, with how we move around in our family, okay, is described by the cohomology of a special fiber. And the map here, so this map, is actually a Poincaré duality map. So it relates homology to cohomology of a singular special fiber. Okay, so this is uh, all very topological in nature, if you want. 
And there is a, another incarnation of this uh, limit Hodge structure, which is due to, uh, I think, Moriko Saito uh, in the context of uh, mixed Hodge modules, in work on mixed Hodge modules. You can actually reconstruct this limit Hodge structure, or maybe I should rather say the limit cohomology as an object in the derived category of mixed Hodge modules as the cohomology uh, of a specific object or rather a complex of sheaves in the nearby cycle. And the miracle here, there is actually a miracle appearing that the uh, filtration that you get on the cohomology um, of the right-hand side. So here, this guy carries a weight filtration, of course, after taking cohomology, due to the fact that this is, well, it's an object in the category of mixed Hodge modules, or maybe if you prefer, is a mixed Hodge structure, agrees with a filtration given by the monodromy operator on the left-hand side, which is the way we define the mixed touch structure on the, le on the left-hand side. So this, this thing is an instance of the weight equal monodromy uh, kind of statement that we will see later in the arithmetic uh, situation. So in this case is, is a theorem, the theorem of sight. Okay, so the how, how does this translate in the arithmetic set? So let me move to um, the following uh, framework. So uh, let's say that I start from a, a proper, smooth, semi-stable with, well, family with a semi-stable reduction over a non-Archimedean local field. So K, big K will be my non-Archimedean local field. It can be QP. It could be FP, double brackets T. It could even be C, double brackets T. Why not? And actually, it will be interesting in considering also this case. So all these fields have a corresponding valuation ring or ring of integers, and they have a rise due field, which can be of characteristic P or of characteristic zero. Now we start from our family X over BK is somehow the analog of our family over the punctured disk and the, the family over the old disk. So including the singular fiber is this script or curly, curly X here. Okay, which leaves over OK. And X0 will be my special fiber again. Now, for any L prime to uh, the, the right view characteristic, we have, well, of course, we have the growth index monodromy theorem. And um, if you, or if you want, it's a, it's, a, it's a version of several statements. And it's telling us that the cohomology, once again, the cohomology of, of the et al cohomology of a, of a generic element of our family, so a lattice cohomology of X, is actually computed by the cohomology of a special fiber with coefficients in a more complicated sheaf, the Eladic nearby cycle functor. Now, why is this useful? Well, essentially because the geometry of X0, even though X0 is a singular variety, it tends to be easier than the geometry of X, which is still a smooth variety, but is over, for example, a more complicated field. So think about the situation where big X is over QP and X0 is over FP. Right, so the field is gets simpler and the geometry gets slightly more complicated, but somehow this is uh, the price you have to pay. So, uh, but the object we care about, so this this Eladi cohomology, okay, is actually uh, what people call the veil de Lean representation. So it carries two operators. So is a is a is a representation of a of a residue field. So at least up to some finite extension, and this is what allows you to talk about weights in the arithmetic context. So weights are replaced by Frobenius weights in this case. And phi here is the Frobenius, is a generator of the, uh, is a topological generator of its fundamental group of the residue field, or a Galois group of residue field. And moreover, yeah, by, by growth index unipotency theorem, there is also uh, another operator, which is this N here. It's called the monodromy operator which goes from V, so our, our vector space, to a twist of V. So the twist here refers to, well, changing the, the, way, the weights, okay? So changing the weights according to Frobenius. And there is a famous conjecture by Deligne saying that also in this case, weight equal monodromy. So it means that, so concretely, this means that if you take the graded pieces with respect to the monodromy filtration, then these are pure uh, like representations of the correct weight.
So it means that up to appropriate shift, the weight, um, the monodromy filtration is in fact the weight filtration. Okay, so, uh, well, here L was different from P. What about the case of L equal P, right? So in this case, uh, one has to be a bit careful because the P adic decade homology, well, which of course you can consider because well, P is invertible in, in big K, so the, the, <clears throat> the, the ground field of variety X. Um, well, as a gala representation, is not, well, it's not unramified. It's not what people call unramified, even after extension. So this is not the right object to talk about weights. And instead, um, work of Fontaine and Janssen suggested the following. So there should exist some kind of cohomology theory. Wait, let's, let me just provisionally denote this by H star of X for um, a variety over big K and even an analytic variety. So, and by analytic, I mean rigid analytic variety, but it's not so important for now. We're following a list of properties. So first of all, this H star X should be a K0 vector space. So K0 here is the maximal unramified extension of, uh, of um, QP contained in K. So concretely is the fraction field of the uh, uh, ring of bit vectors of the residue field, little k. Should be equipped with a Frobenius operator. And that's important because that's what we need to talk about weights. And in analogy with the Aladic situation or the complex situation, should also be equipped with an, with an important monodromy operator. And since uh, we are not very creative, well, this cohomology theory should compare to other cohomology theories, otherwise it would be a bit pointless. And the chosen comparison, at least in the original definition, is the comparison with the RAM cohomology. So the idea is that this uh, mysterious cohomology theory that I'm about to define gives you a K0 structure on the Durham cohomology of your variety X over big K. And being defined over K0, it has a Frobenius. That's important because you need to work over, over an unramified um, extension to have a, to have a, lift of, a well defined lift of Frobenius. And it also has a, as a monodromy operator. So, um, of course, this, is, uh, this has been defined. So, what is this H star of X I'm talking about? Well, the basic case in where, is where there is no monodromy. So if X, like curly X over OK, is a smooth proper model. So in this case, the monodromy is equal to zero in accordance to our intuition from the, from the complex situation. So if you have the family is smooth, there is no monodromy operator. Everything can be filled in the, in the missing fiber. So there is no action of this, uh, of this extra gadget that is floating around. And the, and the cohomology is just, um, is just crystalline cohomology of a special fiber. That's the, 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 the K0 structure. And we know that compares with, to, compares with the ARM cohomology by well, classical results. So what about the more general case? So if uh, X is not smooth, well, this was uh, the so-called hyodo kato cohomology. So this was defined using uh, the tools from logarithmic geometry. So it has to do with equipping the, the special fiber X0 with an extra structure, which is exactly the, the datum of log structure. So there are more recent constructions, which ultimately boil down to the same basic idea due to, well, many people. So I think the most, um, well, I should certainly mention Bailinson, who, who gave his, the, the, the very general construction. And then this was spelled out by Comez and Mizial, uh, Grossiclone and Erland Yamada. They did a lot of technical work on this. But the biggest basic idea is the following. So if you have your X over big K, well, et al locally, and here I really mean rigid et al locally, is, um, is a variety of, you can, you can pretend it's something of semi-stable reduction. So you can, uh, up, which means that up to possibly finite extension of K and possibly, well, let's say up, up possibly blow up on a, on a given chosen model of your X over OK, blow up containing the special fiber, you can solve somehow the singularities of your, of your X in a way that they're not as bad as they could be. So they are at worst um, of semi-stable type. Okay, so this, of course, is a lot of, lot of work. Okay, but let's, we can, you, you can do it. So you can, you can find a formal regular model, again, locally of your gadget, 
And now, once you have your formal regular model, you can declare with the cohomology theory, this uh, our gamma HK, HK stands for yellow cato, is computed as, well, the cohomology of certain um, overconvergent uh, DRAM complex on your log special fiber. So this is a very complicated construction. So a priori involves a lot of choices. So you have to choose models. You have to do things locally. Then you have to compute things using this uh, overconvergent the RAM, blah, blah, blah. And then you have to prove that everything is well-defined. And even if, you're, if you achieve this, and of course you can do that, I mean, that's like the work of all the people I mentioned, then you immediately run into troubles if you want to show, for example, that this cohomology theory satisfies a Kuhnet form. So what about the product? If you have a product of two varieties, even, even they are, if they are very nice, even if they are semi-stable, then the product is no longer semi-stable. So you have to blow up again, you have to solve the singularities again, and so on and so on and so on. And everything becomes very messy. So the goal, our goal was to somehow give a streamlined construction and an alternative construction using entirely methods from homotopy theory. And the advantage of this perspective is, is that, well, it's not restricted to piadic, the piadic situation. So you can actually use it to, uh, to, to, to um, consider um, cohomology theories in the elagic situation or the complex situation as uh, recovering the invariance we considered before. Okay, so let me, let me say what you can do with that. So one consequence of this work is that we get um, a piadic analog of a clement schmidt complex that I stated at the beginning. So this was a conjecture of Flack and Moran and followed by the work of uh, Chiarellotto, Tzuzuki, and, and other people. And um, well, as I said, well, you get a unified somehow treatment of situation over C over N, L and P. And, and uh, this new cohomology theory that, that we built uh, also allows for a cleaner proof of a, of a weight monodromic conjecture. So statement I mentioned before, for complete intersections in toric varieties. So, so I, I, I proved this with, with uh, Hiroki Kato and Alberto Vezzani last year. So we, 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 we wrote a complicated proof of this, of this conjecture, um, uh, sort of following or elaborating on the Schultz strategy of uh, eladic weight monotomy conjecture for complete intersections. And, and this used motivic methods and one of the one of the difficult parts of this proof uh, was was the construction of a Kyodo Kato style cohomology theory for um, varieties defined over equicharacteristic, um, say, local fields, and comparing comparing this along the tilting equivalence of Schultz. So, so this was a we, this was like rather complicated, and 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 uh, we can sort of find some shortcuts with this new work. Okay, so let me. Um, let me say what is the framework in which we we'll work. Okay, so we will consider categories of motivic sheaves. Okay, so what is the what do we mean by that? So first of all, we we start from uh, category C. This is a category of pre sheaves over something with values in the derived infinity categories uh, Q vector spaces dQ. So this will be a presentable compactly generated um, stable infinity category Q linear. And the question mark here, so the input, is some kind of category of geometric nature. So it can be smooth schemes or S, could be, well, S is your favorite scheme, could be regenerative spaces uh, over an adic space S. It could be log schemes, log smooth over, over S. It could be formal schemes over a formal scheme S. It could be many other things and decorations and combinations of the, of the, of the above. And uh, as uh, sort of Morel and Vavotsky uh, told us, with, yeah, you have to do two things. You have to localize with respect to your favorite topology, and the choice will be the tal topology. And then you have to choose how you do homotopy theory. And um, you, can do, you can do A1 homotopy theory. You can do B1 homotopy theory. So B1 is the closed unit disk, which uh, makes sense in the analytic setting. You can... Um, Oops, sorry. Or you can use something like projective line with log structure at infinity. So this two objects 
are very much related to one to the other. So essentially what, well, if you contract A1, or let, let me say, okay, let me phrase things in the following way. So B1, so the unit disk, can be used to cover the amplification of the affine line, A1. So if you have a theory which compares well between the algebraic and the, and the analytic word, well, you better, you, you better kill them all. So you better kill B1 and, and on the analytic side and the A1 on the, on the algebraic side. This gadget instead allows you to uh, work with uh, integral coefficients. And somehow allows you to uh, keep track of the invariants which are killed by A1 homotopy theory. So um, I will not talk much about this today, but somehow it's related to, other, to another part of my research. So I wanted to advertise this bit. And for what we what we do today, it's it's in actually enough to work with more classical with more classical um, motivic categories. Okay, once you have done that, then of course you have to stabilize respect to the tay twist because you want to be able to, you know, to suspend and dissuspend as many times as you like with respect to your sphere and the sphere in this case is given by, is given by GM. All right, so um, these are the two uh, key examples I will, I will be interested in today. So S will be either an addict space, uh, will be very concretely, SPA of CP, for example, with canonical integral structure, or S can be a scheme, well, it can be spec of CP, why not? Or it could be spec of FP bar or whatever. So these are the kind of uh, objects we, we will, will care about. And so objects here will be rigid analytic motives over S or algebraic motives over S. Of course, any object X in a rigid smooth over S will produce by Yoneda an object here. And any X in smooth over S will produce by Yoneda an object here. Okay, it will be the motive of X in the corresponding category. So the, 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 this kind of motivic sheaves, they enjoy many nice properties. So here I listed a few. Um, I, the names I wrote on top are uh, a known ex exhaustive list of people that I should acknowledge, but somehow uh, Joseph, um, Ayub and uh, Joseph, Martin and Alberto, they did the work on the rigid side. So since this is a slightly less known as the uh, algebraic side, I decided to advertise to advertise their names here. Okay, so uh, both uh, DA and rigid DA are etal sheaves of categories. That's not entirely surprising, I suppose. They underlie a six functors formalism. So you have all the functors that you that you like. You have a lower shriek, you have a upper shriek, you have a lower star, and you have upper star, you have a tensor product and the internal home. Okay, so you can do all the cohomology operations that you, that you can, um, that you can desire. Um, a more uh, maybe interesting aspect for our discussion is that the Frobenius, so the Frobenius um, like morphism that you get, uh, for example, out of the Frobenius of, uh, of FP or your favorite field of characteristic, uh, characteristic P gives you an uh, invertible map in motives. You can, you can sort of uh, justify this in many ways. I mean, an easy way to justify this is by using correspondences. So Frobenius gives you a certain, uh, can be, you know, produces certain correspondence, just a graph of a map. And you can look at the transpose of a graph of a map and you can compose in both directions and you get multiplication by say power of P. And since we are working with rational coefficients, this is invertible. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's easy. And uh, why is it important for us? Well, because we can construct a canonical functor from, say, algebraic motives over little k, well, little k is a field of characteristic p, to, well, the category of, this is homotopy fixed points, of a certain endofunctor for Benius on, on dak. So informally, 
this functor sends any, say, K scheme X to the datum of X together with an equivalence with the twist of, um, well, the, the X, X upper one. So this X upper one is, is, the, uh, is the pullback of X along the Frobenius of, of little k. And uh, the consequence of this is that we can canonically enrich objects in our category with a Frobenius structure without, without choices. There's no choice of a Frobenius structure. Somehow there is a canonical thing we can do here. So another um, like amazing property for me of this, uh, of this theory is that this is insensitive to the tilting equivalence of, of Scholze. So if you, it means that if you start from a perfectoid field, so something like CP, so the algebraic closure, so the completion of the algebraic closure of QP or something much um, smaller, so QP, and then you add uh, all the, um, primitive p roots of, uh, of, un of, of one. So they have a corresponding field, uh, equicharacteristic uh, p field. So for example, cp flat in the case of cp. So this would be the completion of the algebraic closure of fpt. And, uh, and motifs don't see the difference between the two. Okay. So you can pass from a situation in equicharacteristic p to a situation in mixed characteristic. And of course, the advantage in doing so is that, well, mixed characteristic is difficult. and Equicharacteristic is supposed to be easier. And, um, and this is something, for example, that we use in our, in our work on the weight monodromic conjecture. Okay, so you can also use this kind of uh, motivic framework to easily construct uh, realizations. So let me uh, say a few, few words about that. So the fields are as before. So we have a little k, uh, which is a field in, say, well, residue of characteristic P. Then you have your ring of integers and your BK, which is your uh, um, the fraction field of OK. So A1 invariant motives satisfy nil invariants, which means that the category of DA little k is equivalent to the category of formal motives over the formal spectrum of OK. So this is nil invariance of uh, A1 local motives. And this would not be true in the case of logarithmic uh, motives in which I contract the line P1 infinity, but it would be true for logarithmic motives in which I contract A1 with a with trivial log structure. So there is something really somehow deep going on here. Okay, so, um, but luckily for us, we are in the, interested in this uh, sort of rational theory. So we, 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 can, we can invert A1. And, um, and this equivalence allows you to construct a functor from DA little k to uh, rigidinetic motives over big K. So this would be a rigidification functor. So essentially when you pass from a formal from a formal scheme to the associated regenerative space, whatever this means. But uh, informally, in it means that you have something over, over OK, the formal spectrum, and then you allow yourself to blow up as much as you like in the special fiber. Once you do that, you get a space, which is an analytic space, and lives over big K. All right, so what is locally doing this functor? So from VA little K to reach the big K. So, well, you start from a motive, from a variety in characteristic P. You locally choose a formal lift over the formal spectrum of OK. And then you invert uh, P. Then you take the rigidification. Now, of course, this is only a recipe which makes sense locally. But this theory tells you that, nevertheless, there is a globally defined functor from um, motives over little k to regenerative motives over big k. So this is the so-called monsky vashnitzer functor. It's called like this because uh, it reminds the sort of, re, re, sort of resembles the construction of the monsky vashnitzer cohomology. Now, once you are in the in this generic fiber situation, you can add an extra piece of structure. So this little dagger here means that you uh, sort of keep your analytic varieties with an overconvergent structure. So somehow your sheaf of of, of um, um, holomorphic functions is is uh, uh, 
uh, uh, is equipped with with the datum of another well another sheaf of functors of functions which converge a bit more. <laughs> Uh, the radius of convergence is a bit is a bit bigger than the one um, a priori they would have, so that's uh, well, it's not so important for us. But it's something that you need to do if you want to uh, look at cohomology theories for uh, non-proper varieties. So somehow for open things, um, well, the RAM cohomology, for example, it's it's not finite-dimensional. If you want to recover finite-dimensionality, you have to impose extra conditions on this function. So anyway, so you can do that and and uh, um, work by um, um, Vanderput and others tell you that the choice of, uh, of a dagger structure is unique up to homotopy. And luckily, we're working up to homotopy here. So it means that canonically, this category is equivalent to the category of overconvergent uh, of varieties with an overconvergent structure. So this was a theorem of Alberto. And now that you have an overconvergent structure, you can apply the rank homology. And overall, if you go from here to here, and you look at the resulting functor, what you have done, well, you got rigid cohomology. So this is an alternative and, uh, in my opinion, very streamlined way to define rigid cohomology for varieties defined over a field of characteristic P. And as I briefly mentioned, there is also a logarithmic version of the story that we developed in the other work. Now, this... Uh, this pair of functors, so the monsky vashinzer functor and its right adjoint, so they, they, they land in a slightly smaller subcategory of rich DABK. So this functor Xi, so this monsky vashinzer functor, actually produces objects in the category denoted rich DAGR. Okay, so this is, the GR stands for good reduction, but is a misleading name. So this is the subcategory of rich DAK, so of Motis over BK, which is generated under extensions by varieties with uh, with good reduction. So admitting a model with good reduction. So don't be fooled by the name. So being generated by extensions by things of good reduction means that you have a lot of things with bad reduction in it. In fact, if you allow yourself to work over, say, CP or actually any algebraically closed field, then there is no difference between rig GAK and rig GAGRK. So this is encoding the fact that up to a finite field extension, um, any compact object at least lives in this subcategory because anything has a model uh, with semi-stable reduction uh, up to a certain number of operations or up to a, a, a field extensions. So this relies on work by, by Temkin on alterations and other people. So this category, rich DAGR, uh, deserves probably the name of unipotent motives. And the reason will be clear in a second. So, okay, so now I, have, I can actually state the main theorems here. So the first one is uh, due to uh, Ayub, Galauer, and Vizzani is an identification of rich DA GRK with rich DA GRK zero. And suddenly we see that if you restrict yourself to things which are in this category, you can canonically, so canonically produce a K zero structure. And a variant of um, Barbeck theorem, because the functors uh, psi was uh, was monoidal and its right adjoint is, is lax monoidal. So you have a canonical factorization with a category of modules over chi of one. So chi of one is, well, chi is the right adjoint and chi of one is an infinity algebra in DAK. So it's a commutative algebra object here. So you have a factorization of a functor uh, of the monsky vashinzer functor through modules over, over, over his algebra object in DAK. And the content of the theorem is that this functor is actually fully faithful. So, uh, and is in this essential image is sort of by definition rich DAGR. So this is an, is a, um, is an equivalence. Once you have, actually, once you have that, uh, this guy is equivalent to this guy, 
and the functor here, as I said, is a barback kind of functor, then it's easy to understand why there is also the equivalence in the middle. Because the right-hand side, so modules over da little k, well, does, does know anything about the big K, only remembers the bit vectors of little k. And that's the reason why you can somehow can promote things to, uh, to, to this maximal ramified extension of QP inside k or, or of your ground field uh, inside k. Now, this chi of one is, um, is actually not mysterious at all. So if you choose a uniformizer of your, of your field, this splits not as an algebra, but only as an object. So splits as one plus one minus one minus one. So it's a cohomological motive of GM. And as an algebra is actually a square zero extension. Okay, so this um, allowed us to sort of study in, in greater details this category. And we got a purely algebraic description of the category that a priori had a lot of analytic information because it was built out of analytic varieties over big K. And now is described in terms of modules, so purely algebraic, in purely algebraic terms, is a category of modules over a certain object inside DA little k. Now you can actually prove an instance of some kind of causal duality here. So if you, if you define H to be the free conial potent uh, co-algebra over Q minus one of your negative tate twist. So informally, this is a direct sum of copies of, well, is, a, is an infinite direct sum of Q of minus I, and it has a deconcatenation product as a, as a, as a co-algebra structure. I mean, of course, you have to work a bit more to make this uh, more topically meaningful, but that's sort of the underlying object. And what we proved is that the category of modules that I introduced before is actually equivalent to the category of co-modules over this uh, co-algebra. And moreover, since this algebra is very simple, they can be described completely by the action of a single uh, operator. So is a certain lax equalizer between the identity functor and the functor T from the AK to the AK, which just sends an object X to X tensor Q minus one. So this is just the negative, uh, so this is just X minus one. That's a very simple functor. And you can look at the lax equalizer of, uh, of these two functors. So you have functor identity, you have T, and they go from the A K to the A K, little K. And you can perform an easy categorical uh, operation that produces another nice infinity category. And this infinity category is actually equivalent to the previous two categories. So to be precise, we actually land in the subcategory of nilpotent objects here. So it means that, um, well, it means we are nilpotent, right? So it means that if uh, the, after a finitely many steps of iteration of the functor T, then you get just the, the zero map. And this is, um, well, that, that's because essentially this category is, well, because I'm restricting to the category of compact objects here. So it's not surprising that we get, we get here. Well, in general, you get something like in the nilpotent object. So, well, it's, that's just a technicality. So not, not so important. Okay, so what, what do we get if we put things together? So we get an equivalence between pre-genetic motives over big K. So a priori big category, a lot of analytic data in it. And this is equivalent to a category of math, like algebraic nature. So motives over little K with an object with an impotent operator. Sounds good, right? So it's so, sort of is, is very close to what we, what we wanted. Okay, so the, the, the actual functor uh, sends an object X to a pair. So the first, um, the fir first entry is an object of DA little K. So it, we, we wrote Psi X, not by accident because this Psi of X as an object of DA little K actually agrees with a motivic nearby cycle constructed by, by Ayub. And, and then there is also a map. So remember, these are objects in this lax fixed point category is just uh, an object and, uh, uh, and, the, and the map between the object and the twist of the object. Okay? And this is just the monodromy, okay? just, a, just an morphism that we call the monodromy operator, monodromy.
Now, you can also produce a Frobenius version. Remember, I told you that motives of little k are canonically equipped with Frobenius. So you can perform the same operation um, on this DA phi k, so where objects are um, a motive together with an equivalence uh, of the, the motive twisted by the Frobenius action. And you eventually produce a category of what we call motivic phi n modules. So these are uh, represented by squares like this. So you have an object M in the A little k. You have your monodromy operator. You have the, the equivalence between M and Frobenius twist. And the, the Frobenius and monodromy are compatible in the obvious way. So why is this, uh, why is this relevant? Well, because it tells you that any homological realization, so any homological functor from say R gamma from the A little k to D, D could be is your favorite category. So this could be um, something like uh, the derived category of um, representations of uh, uh, QA representations of your little k, or it could be a derived category of uh, QB vector spaces. For example, if you use a drum, a drum realization, right, or rather the rigid realization that I discussed before. So this would be the Aladdin homology. Or if you are in the C analytic situation, so if your ground field was the complex numbers and you were interested in something like non Archimedean uh, AQ characteristic zero um, uh, varieties, here you get something like uh, the drive category of uh, uh, Hodge. Uh, structures, hmm? revealing category of odd structures, whatever you like, right? Or mixed odd structures, maybe, whatever you like. So any realization defined on the special fiber. So here, here I have only, only the special fiber inside, can be extended to a realization on the original analytic generic fiber. And in the target, you get. The well, the image of our two functors, right? So, of course, I haven't told you what Frobenius is in the complex analytic situation, but, but let's say you can either imagine it or you can ignore it. So, you, we don't care about that so much now. So the point is that in the target, you get the phi n modules in our uh, category D. And the recipe for this realization is this hat realization. So, the extended realization is. Compute the original realization on the nearby cycle, and you automatically uh, are enriched with a Frobenius and a monodromy operator. So, how do we apply this? For example, we get the Clement Schmidt complexes that I promised. So, using the six functors formalism, you have uh, two canonical fiber sequences in, uh, in uh, so he, this lives in. Uh, um, in DA, okay, okay. So you have, uh, well, the yota is the inclusion of a little k in okay, and j is the, well, big k in okay, as, as you know, usual. <laughs> um, then you have a first um, B fiber sequence, yota upper shriek going to yota upper star, going to chi j upper star. So chi is the classical specialization function, right? So is a, is a, a j lower star, yota upper star. And, but this chi j upper star also fits in another, in another sequence in which you have the nearby cycle psi and the nearby cycle psi with a twist by minus one. And the map in between is exactly our monodromy. So this really pops out of our construction. Okay. And you can see that these two triangles have somehow one vertex in common. So you can, uh, you can combine them, right? So you can jump from one triangle to the other and you get. For any cohomology, any realization, this kind of long sequence. This is just a complex. Beware, this is a complex. It's not necessarily exact, so one needs an extra uh, information to to prove the exactness. And so maybe I say a few words later. Um, so how does it look like? So the cohomology of yota upper shriek. Well, you have a Poincaré duality here. The we map from yota upper shriek to yota upper star can be realized as a Poincaré duality map. So, uh, apply to the homological motive of, uh, say, curly x over curly x over OK. So you look at the cohomological motive of this guy. Here you would get the um, cohomology of x zero, 
sorry, the homology of X0. Here you would get, again, the homology of X0, but with a twist and a shift. So that's actually the cohomology of X0. And this is a Poincaré duality map. Here, the arrow is a different color because here I jump from one triangle to the other one and I get the H star of psi of something. But that was a recipe, still on the board, is a recipe for my uh, extended cohomology on the generic fiber. So here I just write H hat and I get my now a J upper star. Well, J upper star is just my X, right? So the generic fiber. So we, here's the cohomology of, of the generic fiber. There is a monodromy operator, again, the cohomology of the generic fiber, and then I continue like this. Okay. Yeah, and as I said, you can, you can try to mimic this for the Aladic situation or the Hodge, uh, Hodge situation. So um, for the Hodge situation, maybe I should say a couple of, uh, couple of extra words. So um, it's, it's maybe interesting that here we, we actually land in the following fiber product of categories. So D fill of, of um, C uh, tensor over D C D Q. So here, what we actually do is we consider the, um, the filter Hodge realization and the Betty realization with Q coefficients and they are glued along the comparison isomorphism and Betty Deran. Okay, so this the category of Hodge structures, so the derived category of Hodge structure actually uh, we we, sh we showed sits as a subcategory of this of this category here, and this just uh, it's just better to work with the latter because it's a bit more flexible for this kind of uh, constructions. Okay, so um, but now you can say, well, you built some cohomology theory. How do you know that this cohomology theory has anything to do with what people considered before? So why on earth this should be this should be a reasonable definition after all this work? Well, let's focus on the case of a rigid cohomology. So the piadic cohomology I was interested in. Uh, as I said, I can uh, land in the k zero. So uh, I canonically enrich things over, over, over K0. And my hat construction, so my extension, produces an object in the category of, I would say, categorical finite modules over in K0 vector spaces. But you can actually show that this is equivalent to the derived category of the abelian category of finite modules. So this is a, well, this boils down to a certain X computation. So let me swap this under the rock. Okay, so what do, you, do we prove about that? We prove two things. So we prove that the um, our sort of extended cohomology has the expected property. So it has a Frobenius, it has a monodromy by design, and it also compares with the RAM cohomology. Q base change to K, which is good. That's something we wanted. And whenever the classical Yodokato cohomology is, de is, de is defined, our rigid cohomology, standard rigid cohomology, computes it. So you can do this, and as you as, as you see, in a completely homotopical way without choices. There was no there were, were no choices anywhere in this, and so it's canonical. It satisfies a, has a Poincaré duality. You have a Kuhnert uh, isomorphism, and so on and so on and so on, without worrying too much about the fact that you know you have to choose models or blow up models and so on. So, the, but. Here is there's a, I mean, there is also something to be said because the Yodokato cohomology was not obviously motivic, but we, we proved it in our previous in our previous paper. But the classically defined Yodokato cohomology with a lot of effort is actually motivic uh, cohomology, so it's representable in in a certain motivic in motivic category. Okay, so how how can you how can you prove such a state? So, um, the first one. So the first one, so the comparison between rigid cohomology and uh, so this sort of our Yodokato cohomology, let's say, and the Ram cohomology uh, uses the theory of weight structures of uh, Bondarko. Um, so the idea is that in DAK, so pure objects are uh, motives of smooth and proper varieties.
Well, that's not surprising, right? Because pure motives are exactly that, right? Motives are of, of, of smooth and proper varieties. And um, so what about, uh, what about the AKN? So what about this uh, Lux equalizer gadget? So well, essentially the same, but we, uh, we declare that pure objects are, well, objects which are pure in the A, so when we forget the monodromy operator. And moreover, we ask the monodromy operator to be zero. So the idea is that pure objects have no monodromy. So a really somehow um, reminiscent of the idea that if you were coming from a family with, a, with, a, with good reduction, then monodromy operator should be zero. So those are the pure objects for us. Now, if you, um, if you use Bondarko's uh, theory, you can uh, somehow um, canonically um, produce a certain complex of objects in the, in the heart of a weight structure. So a complex in the category uh, of, uh, of, of pure objects in your, in, your, in your theory, which is called the weight complex. And um, the, the, this weight of decomposition, this amount of motivic weight uh, decomposition uh, is, is what allows you after realization to see again, the weight spectral sequences. Okay, so let me not get into much details about that, but it's something that you can build out of the geometry of your variety X. Now, if you use the weight conjectures for rigid, for rigid cohomology as proven by, well, uh, I would I, I should say crew, and then I should say um, um, probably the lean, uh, because last time I, I mentioned uh, how the weight conjectures were proven for rigid cohomology. Uh, Elaine, I know, uh, told me that I should of course always say that the proof is due to the lean. So that's that's the thing. And um, so the vector conjectures. Uh, you know, I'm not joking, of course. That's that's, uh, that's a serious input. So using the lean's work, uh, pimped a bit for rigid cohomology, um, you get that the realization that we consider actually factors through this weight complex constructed by Bondarco, or rather, well, we construct out of Bondarco's theory, and and. As such, it actually factors over the nearby cycle factor. So this all complicated story, and which is a bit technical, but essentially reduces your comparison to something you already know. So to compare the RAM cohomology and our definition for things which are smooth and proper and having a smooth and proper lift, but that's just crystalline cohomology. And we know that the RAM cohomology agrees with crystalline cohomology after a base change. So, that somehow all this, this argument reduces the proof of this comparison to something we already know. So what about B? So this is more subtle. So what we do is, is proving a general detection principle for uh, this kind of realizations. And the idea is um, maybe a bit uh, informal, is that um, anytime you have an object A, say, which is a co-module for your uh, free corneal potent, co-free corneal potent, co-algebra H, whatever. You can embed it into the direct sum of A minus N. So this would be the co-product with, uh, with the co-algebra itself. And here, there is a, a, a miracle, which is um, known to people doing representation theory. If you tensor your representation with your, uh, with a, group um, the, the ring algebra of your of your group, then this is isomorphic as a representation to the trivial representation tensor with a group with a, with a ring algebra. So this tells you that if you understand what happens on the realization of the, your gadget H, then you effectively understand what happens on the realization of any object. So, this tells you that since the, the co-algebra is actually a free co-algebra, that, that the monodromy operator, which is the only thing you have to compare, once you know that our cohomology theory compares to the round cohomology, if you forget the monodromy operator, okay, then the, the, the monodromy is completely determined by the one of the Kummer motive, so-called Kummer motive. So this is the, uh, the only non-trivial extension of one minus one by one, and it's just, you know, built by this uh, very simple matrix, right? It's just 0, 1, 0, 0, 
Okay, so it has a non-trivial entry and it's a non, so it is a non-split extension as objects with monodromy. And of course, if you forget about the monodromy, so you just look at the underlying objects is a, just a sum of one and one minus one. So it's enough to compare our uh, realizations to, um, so it's enough to, let me write here, so it's enough to compare our R gamma hat and the R gamma yodokato as monodromy objects on K. But K is actually the motive of a Tate curve. along the equivalence between ridge DA and DA N. So K lives here, this uh, curly K, so this Coomer object lives here, is an object with monodromy, and the motive of a Tate curve, so I should say the Tate curve, of course is, a, is an analytic object, so it lives here. So once you realize that, then you just need to compute the, the two cohomologies, so our cohomology and the classical cohomology on the Tate curve and check what happens on the monodromy there. And they, they actually agree. And this completes, uh, sort of this completes the proof. Okay, uh, so yeah, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Federico. Yeah, let's all mute ourselves and end the speaker now. Okay, do you have any comments or questions for the speaker? It was a beautiful talk. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Can, can I ask a, a question? Yeah, please. Uh, no, <laughs> so um, uh, what, 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 what of this, um, uh, uh, remains if one does not work uh, with the Q coefficients? Oh, uh, <laughs> good question. Um, right, so um, um, depends on what you want to do. So, so there are, okay, so um, in this theorem, for example, uh, so this equivalence, for example, here between modules and comodules. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, you have to, well, you, we kind of use uh, rational coefficients, okay, to, 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 to pass from, like, to, to describe certain co-algebras in terms of algebras and so on. So you can try to do something um, uh, using divided power algebras instead. So there is margin to, uh, to, to sort of improve this uh, with, um, without using Q coefficients. Um, it's also true that somehow... But this is a very categorical statement somehow. So it's, it, it has little to do with motives per se. It's more uh, like you have a square zero extension and with some properties and you want to identify modules over this uh, square zero algebra with commodules with, with other properties and possibly also yeah. with, with simple set of data like this lax equalizer. So this very categorical part, you know, whatever. So you have to work a bit more. So this... Is it? Is it is it clear that this this the, the motive of GM uh, also uh, integrally is a square zero extension? Yeah, it... exactly. So that's um, that's not quite true, right? So you have to uh, you 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 have to you still need some denominators. Okay. So we have to be that well. We one has to be a bit careful, but um, but something can be done. So some some of its equivalents could hold possibly with without rational coefficients. Uh, it's also true that somehow the kind of applications we had in mind, so, uh, you know, the round cohomology and so on, they are very much rational. So, so it was, we were not very motivated in exploring this, uh, uh, this too much. But so if, if, for example, one would just like to uh, start with a, a motive over K or region, regional leading motive over K mm -hmm. and just, um, uh, uh, just have the functor that will not necessarily be an equivalent, but just have a functor landing in objects with uh, 
the the the, the twisted endomorphism would would mm -hmm. this functor could could still be constructed uh, without q coefficients um Right. So let, okay. Let me let me let me let me say this. Okay. So let me write a couple of things. Um, okay. So so I think the 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 correct statement is the following. Um, so right. Uh, I think I think you need to know that. Okay. So you you have something like this. So you have a free on a certain object M. You have a free algebra over an object M. And then you have a map to one plus M. Okay, so this is like some kind of a, a canonical uh, maybe square zero extension. And, and then you have a, another uh, square zero extension A. So M would be the uh, something like the fiber uh, fiber of the augmentation A to one. Okay, so A is uh, say commutative algebra in your category C. Uh, over one, okay. So with an augmentation, and uh, then then um, these arrows are equivalences, are equivalences. Uh, if uh, the category C is Q linear, and uh, and um, the sim two of M is equal to zero. And we, we use this uh, equivalence to pass from, so it, it, there is a zigzag, okay? And this zigzag is what we use to pass from um, modules to co-modules. And, uh, well, sorry, from modules to this lax um, equalizer, whatever, whatever. So, so right now, I'm not completely sure that um, if you don't have this uh, uh, equivalence, then you get, um, you get easily this, this, uh, this, this functor. But you, you probably can write a map, but it's not going to be an equivalence. Okay. So this is still around kind of the fact, I mean, like the obstacle here is uh, whether or not the motive of GM uh, uh, as, a, as a commutative algebra object is a, is a square zero extension. No, or in some sense, like yes. it, The gap from it being... Uh, yes, um, yes. So it's possible you can interpolate things in an appropriate way. I mean, like, okay, in the back of my head, this kind of problem is similar to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of big leap, but you know that there is uh, this, um, uh, you know, the, the, the equivalence between, uh, the, the, the equivalence between um, mixed graded algebras and uh, algebras with an S1 action um, of, of uh, Twain and Tzosi, this works well over with Q coefficients. And if you don't have Q coefficients, then the two categories have different monoidal structures. So there is no um, um, symmetric monoidal equivalence between these two categories. But um, Twen um, and Marco Robalo and, and uh, uh, I forgot who, <laughs> they, maybe Tazos, yeah, Molinos, they, they, they sort of built another category which interpolates between the two in this universal HKR theorem paper. Mm -hmm. And I guess something similar is happening here. So there is there is a there is a sort of a HKR spirit um, story going on when, when you have this causal duality between modules and commodules and 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 so on. So I suspect that you can sort of try to follow their steps to get a more sophisticated theory and with without rational coefficients. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Cool talk. Thanks. Okay, Jonathan. Any other questions? Um, uh, I have a question. Yeah, please go. Um, um, hi, Ron. Hi, hi. Um, you use the uh, you use the you had the, the this triangle with uh, uh, chi uh, the nearby cycles and the and the monodromy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. Now, um, uh, just um to to make sure about the. Um, um, the, the area of definition, like um, this N was defined by a U for a unipotent near, nearby cycle, as far as I know. So um, do, do you know that in this case, the monodromy is the is uh, unipotent or? or Right, so for, um, yeah, so, do you yeah, so the, the, the setting of this Clement-Schmidt um, kind of sequence was for, so here I was applying for X, 
um, say projective, uh, um, uh, formal uh, over SPF okay um, with uh, semi-stable reduction. And in this in this setting, everything everything is true. <laughs> okay, so so this is just the so it's the nearby cycle. The, the nearby cycle that we get is Joseph's nearby cycle. Everything is true. <laughs> so the difference in general is that you might get some, you know, you, you might need to go to some extension, okay, to get to identify the two functors. So is this uh, yeah. is some like cover of k so you have to take some some extension of k and and, and so on and so on but this has to do with the fact that um, you might not have strict semi-stable reduction over your field already and that you might have to change the field a bit but these are kind of technicalities okay i see uh, so it's, it's the same yeah. fun it's a usual functor it's also the usual function. yeah 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 thank you great talk Thanks. Thanks, Ram. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Hi, Hi Benny. <laughs> um, so maybe I'm a, a little confused. So right there we had the, the Psi was Ayub's motivic nearby cycle functor. Um, and you had this, this H motive, which was the free um, co-algebra. Mm -hmm. uh, is this somehow related to the log motive, which... Yes. Um, Yes, and so can this is the log. Uh, I I forgot Joseph's notations. What was it? Maybe log dual something. Mm -hmm. uh, but so maybe I think Joseph uses a slightly different notation. Maybe it's what is he calls with a Greek letter that I cannot pronounce. Some some curly psi, different psi, slightly different letter. So they, they all agree in the unipotent case. So let's say let's say that we are in the over CP. So then there is no you know no 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 fuzz about the the Galois group acting. Uh, okay, but then some technic just some technicality. The lock head should live in somehow D eight big K. Um, yeah, big the generic. No, 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 no. So no, 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 no. This is this lives. No, no, no. Okay, no, no. <laughs> H lives. So this is really an algebra, an object in the A little k. Okay. Okay. So okay. Um, uh, there is a there is a okay. So the I think what you are thinking at is is an object in. So this is probably originally built in the A G M. Yes. Over little over little k, right? So yeah. when I write this H here. I, I am neglecting the co-algebra structure. So when I write H equal, informally H equal direct sum Q minus I, what I actually mean is that I'm forgetting the monodromy operator. So I'm forgetting the fact that you have an extra structure and just looking at it as a mere object, it's like applying a Q lower star. So where Q is the canonical map from GM to K or to K. So if you forget everything, you just get a stupid object in, uh, in, in, in the A little, little k, right? And of course, uh, the, 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 the juicy part of the story, so where you have uh, extra stuff and so on is that this object actually has a, has a, a coherent sort of co-multiplication and so on and so on. And you can, you can perceive them in different categories according to your taste, okay? So remember that at the end of the day, all these categories are equivalent to uh, reach the A B k, GR. So, so maybe, so you know, maybe your intuition is coming from. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This, so, start, so this side of the story. Through this. Okay. All these I categories guess. are equivalent. So, yeah. so you can see, uh, in, you can you can see them in, in many different uh, many different ways, and so, you know, to my taste, this is the this 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 left hand side is the well is is complicated because you have a lot of geometric data, and the right hand side is really easier because you have a purely algebraic it's, it's pure it's completely algebraic okay okay thanks thank you any other questions 
So I had a silly question to ask, and I mean, I know the answer, but I don't know the explanation. So in, okay, let me just preface it by saying, for people who do the kind of homological algebra that I do, whenever we see a weight structure, like a core T structure, we ask where exactly, like, what are the properties of the, what are the properties of core T st structures that are being used here that T structures didn't have? So in- Oh, why our, is it a weight structure? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you couldn't use T structures there in part A of your last sketch. Mm -hmm. So what were the properties that T structures would not have had that weight structures do have? That oh, you I mean, it's the, 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 the vanishing is completely the, the vanishing between objects is completely in the other way, is in the other mm. direction, right? Yeah. So the orthogonality relation that you use to to build a weight structure is uh, is really reverse to the yeah. the kind of thing you look at you, you having t structures, right? And um, it's simply not true that like pure motives are uh, the the heart of a of a t structure. Well, I mean. Okay, maybe I should say we don't know because we mm. don't have a motivic T structure. Mm -hmm. mm. There's no um, abelian category of motives and so on, so on, so on, and whatever. That's purely, that's all conjectural stuff. We don't care about it. And certainly the obvious T structures that you can consider on the AK, they do not have, and they cannot have um, pure motives as their heart. So that's right. just a no-go result. There are no-go results in this direction. So, mm -hmm. so it's a, the the weight structure really goes in the in the orthogonal direction. So the kind of uh, um, yeah the the, the 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 x groups which have which are zero are the the, the in the in the opposite gradient to what happens yeah. for t structures. So, and that's what makes you know this is what you use to make this uh, to make this work actually. Okay. I mean, yeah, thanks for, in other yeah. words, like motivic homology has uh, varieties have non-trivial motivic homology. Well, child groups are non-trivial, so you have higher x in this category between pure objects. So right. it's not like so it's really not like a T structure. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said I I know that there is something that um, yeah, I think yeah related maybe, to T structures maybe that's that the easiest way. Maybe that's yeah. the cleanest thing to say. And and these categories uh, are they. I mean, are they always compactly generated? Yes. <laughs> um, you, you can I construct mean, these structures then starting with any object. But then again, yeah, like the heart problem will still be there. Yeah. Definitely. Because that's a cohomological, that's a that's an intrinsic property. Yeah, this this they, 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 these are all compactly generated because of some I mean, okay, if with Q coefficients there is no problem. And if you want to work with with if you don't want to invert Q, there are like conditions on the telecomological dimension which can be put on the field so that the thing is compactly generated. But these are all discussed in Joseph's um, papers. But I mean, with Q coefficients, everything is fine. These yeah. are all compactly generated, nice, and so on. Okay. Any other questions for Federico? Well, in that case, um, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can, so I will talk we'll talk about the P1 log stuff in another talk if you invite me again. <laughs> yeah, we will have, actually, no, I mean, I shouldn't. Yeah, we will have Amulinda Krishna uh, as a speaker in June, maybe. Actually, well, I don't know what we'll talk about, but yeah, I mean, I really like listening to talks on this topic. Um, next week, we have uh, Amran Yikotili, um from the BGU. And the week after that, I think we have Gustavo Yasso from Lund. Okay, let's stop recording now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.